Hey everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at in the world. Welcome to the stream today. So you can probably tell we're going to be talking about X-Men. There's some new X-Men comics that came out. And today I'm going to focus on giant size X-Men uh, with Jean Grey and Emma Frost, that special issue, as well as X-Men number seven. You know, the thumbnail and description for this, I was thinking ahead of time, oh, I'm mostly going to focus on giant size X-Men, but I read both of these already this morning and I'm thinking like, I really honestly want to talk more about X-Men 7. Like that issue by Jonathan Hickman, artist Lionel Francis Yu is just really something. And I can already tell just by reading opinions online that, uh, well, opinions are split on this one. Have the X-Men just gone full cult status uh, with this latest plot development? Or are they right for, you know, trying to regain their birthright? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, basically the plot there is that the X-Men, if you remember back in real time to the House of M crossover from like 2005, uh, the end of that crossover series had the Scarlet Witch, who at the time was supposedly the daughter of Magneto, but it turns out that was just a gag by the High Evolutionary. Who, who knows? It's Marvel. But at the end of House of M, uh, Scarlet Witch was basically, she just said, no more mutants. And she's got these reality warping hex powers that basically allowed that for the most part to happen. So this was like decimation. I think that was the story label they put on it. And decimation was there's essentially 198 mutants left. And it's certainly the numbers, you know, creeped back up over the last decade. Uh, but now there's a plot point in the new Dawn of X era for X-Men, for all these mutant characters, even if their powers were taken away and they haven't been um, given back by things like, I mean, there's been a bunch of different ways that mutants have uh, gotten their powers back uh, since House of M. Like, I think one of the more recent stories was like an X-Men Blue, where certain characters were repowered by Mother Vine. Uh, I think that's right, because I didn't read those issues. I just read about them. Um, but now they've got something in X-Men 7 called the Crucible. But to be fair... I'm going to come back to X-Men 7 in a bit and talk about the Crucible and what that means and how these mutants are getting their powers back and who is the first mutant that gets his or her power back. Uh, her. It's her. It's Melody Guthrie. Guthrie. Uh, but before all that, before we dive into X-Men 7, I want to talk a bit about Giant Size X-Men 1 featuring Jean Grey and Emma Frost. And if you didn't know, this was, again, apparently said by Jonathan Hickman, the writer in interviews, but uh, I didn't know about it until I started reading this issue. And then I was getting like wicked deja vu, wicked deja vu reading this and just thinking like, well, this seems there's something very familiar about all this. I felt like Biff Tan in Back to the Future. There's something very familiar about all this. And the familiarity was because this is basically an homage or redo or however you want to call it of an old, old now. At the time, it was new. It was New X-Men, issue 121, one of the earlier issues uh, by Grant Morrison. Remember, he came on the title at 114. And 121 was an all-silent issue, which at the time, this is like Marvel in 2001, 2002, uh, when the editor-in-chief, I think, was Joe Quesada, and the uh, president, I think, was Bill Jemis or Jamas, and that guy... If you don't remember, Bill Jamas, Bill Jamas, I don't know how to say his name. He was a real, he, he had people split the same way that like the new X-Men series has people split on like whether the X-Men are a cult or not. You know, there are people who enjoyed Bill Jamas coming in and shaking things up at Marvel. And there were people who were like, this guy is ruining my childhood. And he would do these stunt events. And like one of the stunt events that him and Joe Quesada uh, were really working on uh, was this event called Nuff Said. And Nuff Said, uh, in the Marvel Universe for a month, it was, some people said, they're being a little sassy, they're saying Nuff Said was an attempt by uh, the editors, or by publishing by Marvel to not pay the letterers on the books. Because the way the story worked is that Nuff said every single book that came out that month from Marvel was an all silent issue, meaning that there was no, you know, there was no dialogue. I think there were some sound effects in some of them, so letters did have, you know, ultimately something to do. 
but you know they're if they're getting paid by the page and there's pages that didn't have any letters on them well you do the math right so one of those issues of Nuff said oh and one more thing about that this was also based on uh in part, I think it was inspired by an old G.I. Joe issue. There was a Snake Eyes issue. And if you know about Snake Eyes, Snake Eyes doesn't talk. He's completely a silent uh, hero. Uh, so there was this old issue of G.I. Joe where uh, Snake Eyes didn't talk at all. So it was like a silent issue. And they basically did that for Marvel for the whole month, as it turned out, uh, in the early 2000s. So the silent issue of X-Men was 121, and it was... The title of it was Silence, Psychic Rescue and Progress. You like how I had to look at my notes? I had to look up, what was, what was that title again? So Silence, Psychic Rescue and Progress was for whatever plot reason at the time, Professor X was in a coma. So both um, Jean Grey and Emma Frost, who at the time, I mean, they've warmed up a bit to each other now. And we'll get to that because there's been, oh my gosh, the Dawn of X, like the thruppling and the additional coupling in this series, in, in the X-Men books now, it's it's on a whole new level. But at the time, back in New X-Men, they were, you know, they were frenemies at best. They might, you might still say they're frenemies, honestly. But at the time in 121, like, Gene was still married to Scott. Uh, he had not yet done, I don't think he had yet, done his mental cheats uh, with the White Queen, Emma Frost. Uh, but that would be soon to come uh, in in the book, in New X-Men. But in this issue, uh, Jean and Emma go into Xavier's mind to do a psychic rescue because he's in a coma. For what reason? What's going on here? Apparently he's being psychically attacked. I think the plot here is he's being psychically attacked by his um, twin sister, Cassandra Nova, super baddie, who I'm not sure, has she been invited to Krakoa yet? Is she there? Is she on the island? All mutants are welcome. I do think she got redeemed. Again, this is something I had to read about. I didn't see these issues, but I believe it was like in the X-Men Red series. Uh, she was, Cassandra Nova was redeemed because she was granted essentially the gift or the punishment of empathy. You say empathy, you know, just being able to feel the, uh, the pain that she made everyone over her life feel and that hopefully reformed her. But you say empathy, I say Ghost Rider's penance stare. Same idea, right? Uh, you just got to feel, you got to feel the pain you gave to others. Um, but back in 121, you know, she was just an out and out villain. Uh, and I think this was, if not like the outright first appearance, like the first initial introduction to this character. Uh, and the crazy thing was actually there was one line at the end. It was an all silent issue, except for one line at the end. Uh, Jean Grey says uh, something along the lines of Professor X Charles tried to kill the... Um, his twin sister in the womb. So while they were still in utero, he could tell, you know, his psychic powers were coming up. He's like, oh, this other, this other twin is going to be bad. I can tell better take her out, which is, you know, one of those, it's definitely in line with like Charles's characterization through the decades of like uh, ultimately thinking he knows better. And like Dawn of X is another iteration of this possibly. I would say in all likelihood of like, yeah, this will be fine. We got an island nation for all the mutants. What could go wrong? Or, you know, I'm going to kill my twin sister in the in the womb. What could go wrong? Well, Charles, there's always something that's going to go wrong. You got to pick up on that. You know, for, for a psychic, you seem really closed-minded to this sort of information. I'll say that. Um, so there's, you know, the, all that to be said, you know, let's flash forward now to giant size X-Men 1, Gene and Emma. And this issue that came out this week, First of all, giant size, more like slightly larger than normal size. I mean, if a normal book is 20 or 22 pages of story and art, this one's a little bit better. It's 30. It's 30 pages of story and art and then a couple of text pages as well. And that's that's all right. But giant size, I honestly thought like this is going to be um, like 80 pages plus, 64, 80 pages, 100 pages maybe. But not quite. Uh, but that's all right, you know. Not purely truth in advertising, but the story itself, like I've already hinted at, is this sort of homage to uh, X-Men, New X-Men 121. But here, the person in the unnecessary coma, or the surprise coma, is Storm. And here's the first big spoiler for this week. So it turns out, what they find out, they go into her psyche, it's very similar to New X-Men, 
where they go into Storm Psyche, and uh, it's pretty much all silent. There's like Emma and Jean are like talking to each other in there at points, but they do it by like creating the letters so that they see them, so that they can like see the message. Uh, you know, different from word balloons where the implication is that, you know, they're just hearing it like words, not that they see each other's balloons. That'd be crazy. Uh, but they go into Storm Psyche, which coincidentally enough looks like, looks a lot like Wakanda. Like if you, you know, everyone saw the Black Panther movie. So if you saw that Black Panther movie, you're probably thinking uh, same as me. Like there's a lot of, it's this sort of belt, savanna, purple hue, uh, well, again, just like how it, how the sort of afterlife or unconscious mystical mental realm appears, what was it, the realm of his ancestors in Black Panther? So it's sort of similar for Storm here, and I don't know if that's because of her Wakanda connections or what, and there's also these giant, like, uh, not Panther, it doesn't look like, but it looks like, it might be Panther, but I think it's these giant lion avatars one of whom turns into a snake. So I don't know if this is like mental defense systems in her head to stop telepaths from coming in and giving her the business. But Storm, these are your friends. It's just Emma and Jean. They're just trying to help you. But as it turns out, they're in there. And, you know, the other thing that makes this maybe not seem as giant size is it's not really a giant size story. Like there's a lot of great visuals here. And we got to thank Russell Dodderman for that, who I read some books by and I'm liking his stuff. If I had to guess, it looks like he works digital, like based on the line work. I'm thinking he's a digital artist, but I could be wrong on that. He could be drawing uh, on artboard. Uh, if anyone knows, let me know. But he's doing good work, uh, and he's really good, I would say, at like telling the story without the benefit of having the dialogue there. So that's also an advantage. Uh, but the story itself, I think we didn't necessarily need 30 pages to tell it. They're not... It's not like they're wasted pages. Again, it's gorgeous looking art. Uh, but, you know, it, since it is the same story as New X-Men 121, and that was told in 22 pages, we know. We know it's the same story. We could have cut eight pages. Uh, but all things considered, still entertaining. And if you like the visuals, this is really a more visually oriented story. But you could tell, oh, wow, I, I would kind of run out of things to talk about if all I was talking about was giant size X-Men. Although there's some other interesting things in there that I will mention, such as, you know, if you compare this, if you go back and you look at New X-Men 121, uh, in that issue, I, I don't think, no, Wolverine's there at the beginning. So it's the same setup where like, or is he there? Now I forget. I just read this 10 minutes ago. I know that at the beginning of Giant Size X-Men, uh, Wolverine and Cyclops are standing there. But at the beginning of New X-Men 121, uh, Scott walks in with Jean. She kisses him goodbye on the cheek. She gives him a little peck on the cheek, uh, which is only appropriate because, again, they're married, happily married for now. Dun, dun, dun. But she gives him a peck on the cheek, and you can compare that to the issue that came out this week, uh, Giant Size X-Men with Jean and Emma. Uh, he does not get the kiss. They come in holding hands, Cyclops and Jean, but then Wolverine, he's definitely there in this one. And he gets the kiss on the cheek. So again, like I've kind of hinted that there are hints in the Dawn of X storyline right now, but like there's some thruppling going on. Like what, like what is the extent of the shared intimacy in the relationship between Logan, Scott, and Jean, not to mention Emma? It's all kind of, I mean, I don't even know what's going on, but there's that. And then when, when we talk about X-Men 7, I'll talk about some other hints in there about like, it seems like, I mean, it does seem like a thruple. It does seem like they're just sharing everything. And I've mentioned last week or the week before when I talked about X-Men number six, the Mystique issue, how when I was a kid uh, reading uh, the comics with Destiny and Mystique, it didn't, I didn't necessarily pick up on the, the story clues that Claremont was very carefully putting in there, that like these two were in love and they were intimate and it was genuinely um, a lesbian relationship. Um, so as a kid, I wasn't bright enough to pick up on those clues, but either I've gotten smarter in 20 plus years, uh, which is possible, or, you know, these clues are a lot more, I'm just getting whacked in the face with them. So which is it? Hard to say, but something's going on. 
So there is that comparison to be made. There's also at the end uh, another sort of homage. And they just straight up, you know it's based on X-Men 121 because they just straight up say special thanks to Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly in the credits for this new giant size X-Men. So, you know, that's like saying, yeah, we know. We know we owe a debt of gratitude to them. Although, again, I always like to make this point, legally speaking, since they all sell their copyrights for the work to Marvel, uh, Marvel is technically the author for legal purposes of all these stories. The corporation of Marvel is the author. And sometimes if you look up like collections of Marvel comics, like say on Google Books, which I did today because I was looking up the title Life Death because that seemed familiar too. But it says like for Life Death, uh, who's the author? <clears throat> well, not Chris Claremont. No, no, no. The author is Marvel. You're welcome. So speaking of Life Death, like I said, that is the title for this new issue of X-Men number seven, but it's also uh, the old, another Storm-centric issue or series of issues back from the late 80s where Storm had lost her powers. So there is kind of this interesting parallel where, you know, the Crucible and X-Men 7 were talking about the mutants who have lost their powers uh, thanks to M-Day and the Scarlet Witch's uh, machinations. And that's similar to a point with the plot of Storm having lost her powers thanks to, I guess, a gun that Forge had shot at her that makes mutants lose their powers. So some similarity there. But we'll come back to that. The other stuff about giant size X-Men uh, in terms of homage that I wanted to mention was that it's the same dialogue at the end where Jean comes out and she says, we ought to talk. She gives basically the description of the plot of what just happened in the preceding 20 or 29 pages. And we ought to talk. Same line as in uh, Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely's new X-Men 121. And this one she's saying, what we got to talk about is that the children of the vault have given Storm this machine virus. There's this great visual uh, in in Storm's mind earlier in the in earlier in the issue, where they base like Storm's face gets ripped away, and you see this like machine, uh, this sort of. If you've ever seen Superman three, it's that sort of thing, that sort of machine. Although I guess it was, it wasn't the machine was added, but I hear it's the face is ripped away and the machine is there underneath, and there's a timer, 29 days left. So we know Jean comes out and she says, the children of the vault have given this machine virus to Storm that will kill her uh, in 30 days if we don't do something. But, you know, 30 days for the X-Men, probably, if I had to guess, we're not going to find out about it for, until June. I'm going to say until June, because if you didn't, if you didn't know, I'll tell you the release schedule for the X-Men books, the giant size X-Men specials going forward. And I think Hickman's on record as saying that these are basically they're annuals. So think of this as like an annual crossover for the year, like what Atlantis attacks or days of future present or, you know, all those stories they used to do back in the late 80s, early 90s as crossovers in the annuals. And so the the annuals uh, this time, the giant size X-Men following up this issue, we've got an issue uh, next up is in March, we've got a Nightcrawler. Giant Size X-Men with art by Alan Davis, legend, living legend, artist of Excalibur, and so many other great things. Uh, Captain Britain with Alan Moore, which I believe, you know, that those early Cat Captain Britain comics from Marvel UK are like the first usage of the 616 multiverse designation for the main Marvel continuity, which I always thought was neat, just the way that they label those alternate dimensions and uh, universes within Marvel Comics. But I think that was going back to those Captain Britain comics, first appearance of that. Uh, but anyway, Alan Davis drawing a Nightcrawler giant size with, uh, again, written by Hickman. Hickman's writing all of them. And then following, up, following that up in April with a giant size Magneto with art by Ben Oliver, who I remember doing uh, some Ultimate X-Men books back in the day. And I'm sure some other stuff too. Uh, oh, and I'm checking in on the chat. Looks like Thriller Art has joined us. Hi. He's saying, hi, Evan, I'm in my car, so chat will be minimal, and that is perfectly all right. I just appreciate you joining in. I know you mentioned uh, on your channel that you were going out of town for the weekend, so if that was, you know, vacation or whatever it was, I hope it was a good time. Hope you enjoyed it, and again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, so I was talking about the upcoming X-Men books. We got Giant Size, Nightcrawler, 
in March, Giant Size Magneto in April, Giant Size Phantom X in May, who again, I think most well remembered for say the Weapon X stuff or the Weapon Plus stuff, those stories that were in, again, Grant Morrison's new X-Men back in the early 2000s. And then why I say we're probably gonna have to wait till June for uh, the finishing up of this story with Gene and Emma from this special because Giant Size X-Men Storm comes out in June. That will be the last of these five Giant Size X-Men specials. And I'm thinking that's going to be where, you know, Storm gets fixed, where they, you know, deal with the machine virus ultimately. I'm really thinking that's where they go with it. So, you know, if we're going to have to wait till June to find out about that, and there's also this upcoming crossover, Empire with a Y, E-M-P-Y, R-E, which is more an Avengers Fantastic Four crossover, but all the Marvel books, I think, are getting roped into this. So I don't know how much of that I'm going to read, but I'll definitely read the X-Men stuff. Uh, but that's like the next couple of X-Men issues. So if they're doing that, they got to deal with Empire. They got to deal with... Uh, I'm still waiting on... What I'm getting at is I'm still waiting on them to deal with, you know, Sync and Darwin and X-23. They're all in the vault right now. What about them? They've been in there half a millennia in their time. And it's creeping up on a month, real time. So when are we going to get some resolution to that story? Uh, I'll tell you where we're not going to get it. We're not going to get it in X-Men 7. And that would be a great segue to start talking about X-Men 7. But there is one other thing I wanted to point out on Giant Size X-Men. Um, even though this is obviously an homage to you know, this sort of psychic rescue in progress uh, from New X-Men 121, it's also probably not an homage, but... It reminded me too, and the visuals reminded me of this, like Dodderman drawing uh, Emma and Jean like walking up these like psychic stairs in Storm's mind. I was like, where have I seen something similar to this before? And I was like, oh yeah, the other psychic rescue in comics that probably my favorite, if I'm being honest, is not from the X-Men, but from a comic that shared a lot of DNA with the X-Men, so to speak. And that was Jim Lee's Wildcats back in the early 90s. After Jim Lee had uh, moved on from his initial run on the title uh, after issue 13, if you remember, I don't know if you ever read this. If you haven't, you got to go back. Those first 20 issues of Wildcats, the first volume from the 90s, are just killer. Uh, even if you're purely an X-Men fan, I really recommend that early Wildstorm and Wildcat stuff. It was really, it was really coherent, cohesive. It all worked together. It was all great, great comics. Really, uh, really great stuff. But after Jim Lee and Brandon Che moved on, the newest team after them, I believe, was James Robinson, at the time probably most famous for writing Starman and the Golden Age for DC. And uh, one of my favorite artists, I'll just say my favorite artist, my favorite comic book artist of all time, Travis Charest. Uh The man has so much talent. I just, I think I've said this before in videos. I just, I wish, I wish he would do more regular comic sequential work. I understand that, you know, he really takes his time and he's like doing full, like uh, full painting, like not digitally, but actually, do, I think he actually does like digital colors and then goes back and paints the real illustration board once he gets what he, he wants. Uh, so he's incredible, Travis Charest. But back in the day, he did a couple of issues on uh, Wildcats. And I think, you know, this, a bit of trivia, like I say he's, Hasn't done a lot of sequentials. I think the longest run he's ever had on a series has just been four issues in a row. And that was like early Dark, Stuck Dark, Dark Stars stuff for DC. He did like issues four through seven. So four, five, six, seven. And then when he moved over to Wildcats, he did issues 15, 16, 17, 18. Then Jim Lee came back to 19. Then Travis did 20 and 21. So, you know, he's never had more than four unbroken issues in a row which is unfortunate because he's so great. I wish, you know, I wish there was more work by him. But, you know, the connection between that and this new X-Men book, the old Wildcats and the new X-Men, is that there is this character, uh, Voodoo, Priscilla Katane, who was knocked out in a fight in Wildcats issue 15, so she goes into a coma. And then like Void, you know, they're equivalent of, she's not quite a telepath, but she's got like, she can she can like travel through space so she traveled into voodoo's mind somehow you know i forget how the plot worked but it was very similar it was this sort of psychic rescue in progress plot so 
If that sound, if you like these plots in X-Men, I guarantee you'll like it and you'll love the art by Travis Charest. So I really can't oversell that enough. If you haven't checked out those Wildcats issues, at the very least, go back, check out those four, 15, 16, 17, 18 Wildcats Volume 1. You will not regret uh, checking out those comics. It is, if you like X-Men, you'll love those books. They're really great. They're really entertaining and incredible art. Okay, so I'll shut up about Wildcats now. Back to what you want to know about what's happening in X-Men number seven. So what is happening in X-Men number seven? Well, this issue is called, like I already hinted, uh, or I already just said this, this is called Life Death, which it's kind of another homage. Two homages from Hickman this week. And if the other books are doing it, I'm not sure yet. I haven't read them. The other books that came out this week, New Mutants uh, 8, X-Force 8, and X-Men Fantastic Four, that crossover issue two. I will read those at, this, at some point, but I haven't read them yet. I've uh, looked through the art in X-Men Fantastic Four because I'm such a fan of Terry Dodson and his pencils, his art. He does great work. Um, but I haven't read it yet. I know there's some Doctor Doom action in there. But back to X-Men 7, the issue I have read. This is called Life Death. Like I said, a sort of homage reference to the story, the famous story featuring Storm and Forge. Forge, where she, you know, basically has to learn to live without her powers. And will Storm and Forge be able to make a go of it? Will they make, will their romance blossom? Spoiler alert, it doesn't really look like it worked out. And then she married T'Challa from Black Panther, the Black Panther. So, yeah, looks like, you know, hindsight being 2020, Forge and Storm did not work out. But that issue's great, and it's actually... I only have, at this point, one signed book by Chris Claremont. I've met him, talked to him at a convention, got a book signed by him, and that book is Uncanny X-Men 186, the first of the Life Death Issues, with art by Barry Windsor Smith, who I would love to meet someday. I don't know if he does convention appearances, but if uh, Barry Windsor Smith did, I would love to get him to also sign that issue. And, you know, you don't always do this, but I did also meet Tom Orzakowski, the letterer for that book. Now the letterer on Spawn, he's been lettering Spawn for like 300 plus issues now. And he signed my copy of X-Men 186. So that was also very awesome, in my opinion. Uh, but this new issue, number seven, Life Death, is different. It's a little different. It's really more a matter of scale is what we're talking about here. And like I already mentioned, like we're talking about uh, the fallout from House of M in M-Day, where... The mutant population was decimated by those three little words from uh, the Scarlet Witch, No More Mutants, where she took them down to, at the time, there was only like 198 mutants left. But like I said, there's been some creep. People have been coming back. Mutants have been coming back since then. But now, in X-Men 7, they've got the Crucible. So now the island nation of Krakoa, they already have a means of resurrection, right? So they have the potential for, if anyone dies, they can bring them back. And if they bring them back, I guess in theory what happens is they've also got the know-how. I think in part there's some speculation that has to do with like Mr. Sinister and his cloning methodology. So there is some uh, theories that he is able to, uh, you know, bring back even if they die without the powers. They can use the five, the five mutants that are, are part of the resurrection protocols, as well as the chimera knowledge that's hinted at in Powers of Ten and House of X, those miniseries from last year, uh, in the, the dark art science of Mr. Sinister, they can bring him back with their powers. But, you know, they don't want... This is actually kind of an interesting plot point. Like, in this issue, they're saying we don't just want a bunch of mutants who no longer have their powers to just commit suicide or just, like, kill themselves and expect to be resurrected because that could be, like... You know, if we're just going with, what was it, Genosha, you know, they killed 16.5 million or something. But if we're talking like in the millions of dead mutants or former mutants, you know, that's really going to overwhelm these five mutants who are in charge of the resurrection protocols. So they have to put into place what they call the crucible. And the crucible is this sort of, it's, it's funny because it's like this sort of inverse of survival of the fittest. And I say that because if you read the issue, you know Apocalypse is involved in this. Like to face the crucible means to face Apocalypse in 
essentially gladiatorial combat with the knowledge that you will lose. You will lose and you will die. Um, but he'll beat you up a bit. He'll stab you with a sword. And then he'll say, uh, do, do you want to live as you are? Do you want to be a human? Do you want to stay as this? We have mutant healers. They can heal you. They can bring you back. So it's like taking you to the precipice of death and then saying, isn't this scary? You probably don't want to die. You'd probably rather just stay a human. It's easier that way. But the initial mutant who faces the crucible is, I already said, Melody Guthrie. Melody Guthrie of the Guthrie clan, who you know, most famous Guthrie, is Samuel Guthrie, uh, can, also known as Cannonball. Uh, initial New Mutant from back in the 80s, graduated to the X-Men in uh, the 90s, became part of the Avengers in the 2000s and in the 2010s. I guess technically he's part of the Shi'ar Imperial Guard because he lives up there. He married Smasher, has a kid. Uh, but he's back here, Cannonball Samuel Guthrie. I got to say it like that every time. He, he is back in this issue as well as the other uh, members of the Guthrie clan who are mutants. There's actually four of them. So out of ten kids in the Guthrie's, four of them were born mutants. There's Melody, who lost her powers during M-Day. Icarus, who I suppose did not because he's got wings, he can fly. And we see him, I think, in the background of the first page or two in X-Men 7. I'm pretty sure that's Icarus. And Paige, Paige Guthrie. Husk, one of the founding members of Generation X from the early 90s, early to mid 90s. And of course, Sam, Sam Guthrie. And three of those four, like I said, still mutants. Melody lost her powers. She was called Arrow. That was her code name, A E R O, which is, you know, kind of funny now because there's a new, I mean, I'm sure you guys know the news, there's a new Chinese Marvel superhero called Arrow, Lei Ling who is just, just that, like Chinese national superhero, who's now got this code name. It's just funny because it's not even like a separate publisher. It's like Marvel now has multiple characters named Arrow, but they, you know, they've done that before where there have been characters who have shared code names. Uh, but is she gonna fight, is this, is the mutant Arrow gonna fight the Chinese Arrow for the right to use this code name? I don't know. If my guess is they'll probably, they'll probably keep it separated. Um, but Melody, you know, has not been a mutant since M-Day, and she really, she's going to face the Crucible. She faces Apocalypse in gladiatorial combat uh, to, to get her powers back, essentially. And, you know, it brings up a lot of theological and ethical questions, and the mouthpiece in this issue for these ethical questions of, like, is this right? You know, it's this sort of extension of, should we be playing God? So who better to ask these questions than the X-Men's resident mutant Catholic priest, uh, Nightcrawler, Kurt Wagner, the inimitable Nightcrawler. Uh, he is like, should we really be doing this? I can't say if it's right or wrong. I just know I have questions. There's a great line from Cyclops. They're talking throughout the issue. And he's saying like, well, you've convinced me of one thing, Kurt. You've definitely got questions. So, you know, it, but... Like I already mentioned, like with the stuff with Professor X or now the mutants as a whole thinking they know best what to do or like trying to build this utopia, trying to build this ideal world, you know they're just getting set up, set up for a fall. It's like that's ultimately the nature. It'd be one thing like if this was, you know, a finite novel where Hickman was writing a book and at the end we could say and they lived happily ever after, the end. But again, I've made this point plenty of times because of the nature of ongoing serialized fiction, we know that there is going to be a fall, you know, a temporary fall. And it's like that line from Batman Begins. Why do why do we fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves back up again. So the X-Men will fall, they'll pick themselves back up. But the Krakoan era, I would say, is not going to be permanent. And the resurrection protocols are not going to be permanent. But this time, what might be permanent is the repowering of Melody Guthrie. Uh, I don't know that they would go so far as to take her powers away again. That just seems cruel. For more on her, I didn't remember this series that well. I read some of the early issues. They did, uh, she was in like the, she was in the volume of New X-Men that followed up when X-Men switched to New X-Men and then back to just X-Men. They started a separate volume. So New X-Men volume two, I think she's in that a bit. But then after M-Day, you know, her powers are taken away. And it's also kind of brutal. I already said this earlier in this stream. It's also kind of brutal that in, um, 
in uh, uh, in Uncanny Avengers, it was revealed that Scarlet Witch was actually not a mutant. So it's brutal now. The mutants really, they're just like, you're not one of us, so we don't care about you. It's this real anti-Scarlet Witch propaganda that Exodus, in this issue, is feeding these young mutant children on Krakoa. Just like, it's basically the, the way they talk about Voldemort in Harry Potter is the way they're talking about uh, uh, the Scarlet Witch Wanda Maximoff in this issue of X-Men. It's like she was, you know, she's she's the worst villain of all time because she took away all these mutant powers. And she's not a mutant herself, so there's no justification in their eyes. And, you know, again, just kind of brutal. I wonder, I don't think we've seen Pietro Quicksilver in this, and I forget if he still counts as a mutant or not. And then the other thing, there's also been, if you read... Alan Heimberg and Jim Chung's uh, Young Avengers or Avengers, the Children's Crusades featuring the Young Avengers. That whole book was kind of about that nine issue miniseries. A lot of that was about, I think, rehabilitating Wanda as a character after the fallout from House of M. And I think what they had said was that, you know, it wasn't really her fault. This was all sort of machinations by Dr. Doom. He was behind it. But then you flash forward today, and I think, again, I haven't read the issue yet, the X-Men are being friendly with Doom in one issue in X-Men Fantastic Four, while also bad-mouthing the Scarlet Witch, who I thought we had established as not being at blame for the No More Mutants thing. But I don't know. It depends on, you know, who's writing the book at the time and what they want to decide, because sometimes these things change. Like, a uh, big example is Lockjaw, the inhuman dog. Is he a dog or is he a deformed inhuman? It depends on if you ask Peter David or John Byrne, right? That's one of the famous examples of that. Uh, so anyway, also good stuff in this issue. You know, technically, if Giant Size X-Men is Giant Size at 30 pages, then heck, so is this issue of X-Men, because X-Men 7 is also, I didn't realize this uh, before I started reading it, but also 30 pages. So also Giant Size compared to the normal 20 or 22 pages of story and art. So that's really awesome too. And it's even better because, you know, as much as I like Russell Donovan's art, I love Lionel Francis, Lionel Francis Yu's art. That guy is also, like Alan Davis, a living legend. So the fact that he's back after two very good fill-in issues. I really did like, you know, the fill-in issues by R.B. Silva and uh, Matteo uh, Bafogni. But it's great to have Lionel back. Uh, in this issue, and it's great that he's doing even more pages than just the typical 20 or 22. Although I might have said, you know, why not, if you really want to make it giant size, and also, you know, this is just my pet peeve, I really like it when we keep the artist consistent for a run on a book, why not take what was X-Men 5 and 6 with the fill-in artist and put those as stories into one of those giant size X-Men specials and really make it giant size, and then have this issue... X-Men 7, just be X-Men 5. Why not? What's the difference? I mean, the way these are set up, a lot of the, basically all of them, these uh, Hickman stories are essentially done in, they're done in one. Like they're story seeding and they're foreshadowing and they're setting up stuff that we're going to deal with later in future issues. But so far it's been like, this issue has a plot, issue one has a plot, separate from issue two, separate from issue three, separate from issue four. And it's not even the same characters each time. We're getting some repeats, and if it's anybody's book, I might still say it's mostly Cyclops' book, but even he's not in every single issue. I don't think. Uh, but, you know, speaking of Cyclops, I, you know, I talked about the weird sort of relationship dynamics at play in the Dawn of X era. I mean, I say weird. Maybe I'm not being progressive enough. Maybe this is just, maybe this is the wave of the future, all this throupling. I don't know. I'm not convinced, but I would like to subscribe to your newsletter. Old Simpsons gag. So here, early on, we've got uh, Wolverine and Scott, you know, up on the X-Men's house on the moon, I think near where the Inhumans live, same neighborhood, blue area of the moon. And they're talking about, I don't know if it's a vacation or what, but like going to an area for, I think, r and Because they talk about uh, Wolverine's excited. They're going to go to this space island called Chandelure, which was also mentioned... Uh, in New Mutant 7 a week or two ago, uh, Cyclops was saying to 
Gladiator, hey, can I put one of these cool Krakoan flower gates on Chandelure? It would really help with the uh, vacationing I want to do. Oh, and looking at the chat, Azette says hello. Hello, Azette. Welcome. Welcome. Talking about some X-Men comics today, and it's good to see you. Thanks for joining in. Uh, so they put the gate up on Chandelure, and in this issue, uh, Cyclops is like, hey, Wolverine, we're going to go to Chandelure. You want to come? It's uh, got great views. It's really beautiful. And Wolverine's like, yeah, sure, it's great views. Genie in a bikini. You know, Jean Grey in a bikini. And Scott says about himself, Scotty in a Speedo. And Wolverine's like, yeah, who, would, who wouldn't like that? You know, you know, it's not an actor. I can't hear him say the line, so I don't know exactly the tone or the delivery here. But it sounds like, honestly, it sounds like he's down with it. He's down with this Scotty in a Speedo, Genie in a bikini. So what is... You know, again, I just have to ask, what is this relationship? What is going on between these three? And if Emma's involved, possibly these four. I don't know. I'm not even sure I want to know. But that's got to be coming up at some point. Like an expansion of this plot point of... And again, it's like, I think I think ultimately this is like a setup for a fall. Like saying, okay, like we're trying to build this ideal utopian relationship but I don't see it maintaining, honestly. I see I see feelings getting hurt. Based on what I know about how people react to this sort of thing in reality, I'm thinking feelings are going to get hurt with these mutant characters too. And probably uh, a maintaining of the status quo or return to the previous status quo of uh, Jean Grey and Emma Frost being frenemies at best, frosty friends at best. All right, so I am getting close to finishing up. There's some, you know, extra shading and detail lines I want to throw in here on this head sketch of Jean Grey that I was working on today. But I think I've said a good portion of what I wanted to about these new X-Men books. So after I finish up the details here, I might call it for the day. Although if anyone is in the chat and you got any questions or comments about the X-Men that you'd like some clarification on, I'll do my best to answer while we've got time. Otherwise, I'll go into the YouTube sales pitch, the canned YouTube sales pitch, which is, you've heard it before. Uh, if you like the video, please, would you consider smashing that like button? Gently smash the like. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, uh, it's funny, PewDiePie's been pointing this out. If you watch his videos, he's saying like, hey, it's 66% of you are not subscribed. Let's do something about that. And I don't know if I'm doing better or worse. Because, better, or, Well, certainly, just in terms of raw numbers, I'm doing worse. But in terms of being watched, it's like a 60-30 split where 60% of my viewers are coming from non-subscribers. And I don't know if that's better or worse than 66%. I'm not sure where you want that number to be because it seems like you, know, you always want people to be coming in and discovering the channel. But then you know, hopefully you want them to uh, subscribe, Tap the bell for notifications uh, so you can always find out when I'm going live. But I'll also let you know, uh, it's I got a rough schedule I'm working on now for going live. And that is that I have been doing it Wednesday morning after I read the new X-Men comics. And luckily, there's always plenty of material because they're dropping like five or six new X-Men books a week. Wow. Uh, so there's always that. And then also Saturday evening kind of whatever's going on. It turns out with the news last week of the publisher, co-publisher of DC Comics getting fired, everyone had something to say about that, me included, playing armchair analysis, analyst, armchair analyst and potential publisher myself. Like, what would I do? But anyway, depending on what the news is, that'll kind of determine what I talk about this weekend. Although I'm thinking, I've got the, I've got the new Art T-Bear black and white comic. I've got a physical copy of that that he sold on Indiegogo, and I'm thinking if I read that this week, I might do some fan art for that, for black and white, and then talk about that and why I'm such a fan of Art T. Bear, and I have been since the 90s. So that's what I'm leaning towards, unless there is some crazy news that pops up between now and Saturday. And I'm also considering my schedule right now, really, I'm kind of, because YouTube is like a fun side project, that I'm working on. I can basically do Wednesday and Saturday for streaming. Uh, I have been considering, you know, scheduling and my own abilities allowing to at some point start adding a couple days. So if anyone has any thoughts about like good days or times uh, to go live, 
uh, let me know, and I will consider that. You know, some of the some of the people who have you know a lot of popularity with this, they talk about like a schedule of Monday, Wednesday, Friday night, and Saturday morning, and I like that. That's kind of interesting because uh, the Saturday morning especially reminds me of, like Saturday morning cartoons. And it'd be funny, you know, like I'm just drawing comics. I think it would be neat to do like some sort of Steve Dildarian sort of limited animation where it's like maybe I just do the one shot here and then like another shot where I make the mouth move and then it's just those two frames. And I could do like live animation with that kind of. That'd be funny. Uh, but, you know, just the idea of streaming on Saturday morning makes me think of that, like Saturday morning cartoons. It really takes me back, you know. Kids today don't know what they're missing out on. When the Cartoon Network schedule is, last time I checked, it's like 23 hours of Teen Titans Go. I don't know if they still do that. But, you know, back in the day, there's a lot more variety in Saturday morning. But, of course, now you've got streaming. So it's like I could go on to, say, Disney Plus and look at, uh, I could just look at, you know, all the Marvel cartoons and Disney cartoons from my youth, for example. So Kyle's got another comment. He's saying it's a full-time job to keep up with X-Men. Absolutely true. Uh, and I don't... You know, like I said earlier in the stream, like I, I'm, I know there's people who keep up with it better than me because I can't keep these multiple plots in my head. Like it was enough to remember everything I wanted to say about the two issues this week. And then there's like three others besides that. So yeah, it's more than full time. And you also say, Kyle says, Thrill Art says, I just discovered Art T. Bear and he has such a good style and many styles apparently. Yeah, he's great. And he's one of those guys, you say many styles and it's true he just did another Indiegogo for, I think, a book called Chrono Mechanics, which is in a more cartoony style. You know, there's like the Marvel sort of house, not quite realistic, but more realistic than a Disney cartoon, we'll say. Uh, and then there is, you know, what he does with Chrono Mechanics, which is more like, you know, sort of a animated sort of style to it. So there's that. And then there is... Another guy who does this that I was reminded of is Ian Churchill. Ian Churchill has that same sort of split between styles. So if you like Art T. Bear, I think you might also like Ian Churchill. All right, so now I am basically, there's a couple spots in here where it's like, if I still see white, I wanna make it more black lines. You know, get some solidity there. But other than that, I am rapidly approaching the end. So I will, again, thank everyone who joined in to watch this live and join the chat. AZ, Thrill Art, loved having you guys here. Anyone else that might have been watching, but, you know, was watching in silence, which is perfectly all right, too. And, of course, those who will search out X-Men reviews later on today on YouTube and hopefully find the video. And hopefully, like I already mentioned, like it so much that they smash that like on the video subscribe to the channel, and join me for future streams. And like I said, the next one that I'm definitely going to do will be this Saturday evening. You know, all things, all things permitting. You know, you never know. Something, something catastrophic could happen. You know, it's not invite catastrophe. But something bad could happen, and I could get delayed. But I also put up, like for this uh, episode, I did put up like the preview thumbnail and everything, the description on uh, YouTube, like yesterday evening, to get everyone advance warning. And I'll do that again, either Thursday or Friday, to give everyone advance warning for what I'm thinking of will do for the Saturday stream. So hopefully, everyone that joined this time can join next time, and hopefully even more. Because I know the other thing is, it's evening somewhere, but I think, you know, I'm in America, obviously. Maybe it's obvious. And... Here, I think that the popular times for YouTube streaming tend to be a lot more in the evening, Eastern Standard Time, like 8 p.m. or so. So, Saturday evening, look forward to it, mark your calendars, and there we go. That is it. This is my Jean Grey art, and if you stuck around this long, I'll just show you what I've been working on in terms of the entire page. And this is what I'll go out on. You can tell this is kind of, uh, you know, a Wolverine-centric page. Then he attacks Gene for some reason. I'm not sure what the plot is here. 
but she gets up. So you can see this is it. This is a work in progress. And then I've also got over here a sort of mystique, as it turns out, versus uh, versus rogue page. And then there's that. And then there's also an older page I had that I did uh, that I got to get back to coloring and inking at some point with Apocalypse and Psylocke. So a bunch of stuff I've been working on, but you know. Uh, not finished yet. Someday, someday. But I'm always tempted to be working on other things. Anyway, that's it for this time. Thanks everyone for joining me, and I will see you on Saturday, hopefully.